sponsored by the James Madison Council. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the 2021 Library of Congress National Book Festival. My name is Jumi Olabanji. I'm an anchor with NBC4 in Washington, D.C. Thanks so much for being with us this evening. And I am just thrilled to be joined for this awesome conversation by Rodney Scott and Trisha Yearwood. They're here to talk about their brand new books. We have Rodney's book. I have it right here, World of Barbecue. Every day is a good day. And Trisha's easy comfort food, family and friends. Thank you both for being with us. I know we've got a lot of people watching in a short amount of time, so I wanna get right into the questions. Um, and the first one will be for you, Trisha. So this year's festival theme is open a book, open the world. And I know this is your fourth book that is going to be coming out in just a few days. Uh, so talk to us about what this means for you and how do books open the world for you? Well, I'm a big reader anyway. I mean, Garth says, my husband says I eat books because I'm always reading about something and I like every different kind of book. And, and I don't want to just like start being fangirl to Rodney, but just skimming through his book, I can't wait to sit down with a cup of coffee, a pot of coffee and read this book because it's not just about the food and the recipes and ingredients. It's about the why, why is this important and why is this special? And it's, it connects us all. It's, you know, we need things that bring us together and show what we have in common. And food is one of those things that we all share and we all have in common. And Rodney, I know this is your first book. So how do you hope that this book opens the world for you? Wow. You know, I have to agree with you, Tricia, that, you know, food is one of the universal languages. And, and hopefully that this book can help bring the world together and help people connect and enjoy each other and, uh, and, and enjoy making food together, creating memories. So Trisha, I know you start this book off and you talk about the pandemic and what that was like for you and your family. When it comes to food and uh, this cookbook, what did you learn through the pandemic and what that meant for you and your family and this comfort level with food? You know, it was kind of a reminder for me. I grew up in a really small town in Georgia um, we didn't have any restaurants, you know, so, and my mom was a really good cook. We had a garden, we killed our own beef and hogs. And so we pretty much ate around the table just as a family every night. And, you know, as an adult and moving to Nashville and being in the music industry, I feel like we all move away. Everybody gets crazy. Everybody travels. And as hard as that this last year and a half have been in so many ways, one of the good things that came out of it for me was a reminder of that family around the table and it doesn't need to be you don't need to be out jet setting all the time and really sitting around that table and that's for me and my family it was making the food together laughing through that learning through that and we would always sit around the table long after the, the meal was over and talk until we got hungry again and maybe somebody would pick at something that was still on the table you know so it was a reminder of kind of really what's important and it seemed to always center around the table at my house. And you also mentioned in your book, Trisha, that cooking is about love. And I feel like that quote kind of stuck with me. Can you kind of deep, uh, deep dive into that and what you mean by cooking is love to you? Well, I, I love to cook for people. I love to, and, and I'm, a, I'm a home cook like my mom and dad. Um, and so I, I know what I know. And I always just, I love to cook for people. It makes, it brings me joy, the process of cooking the meal and sharing it with people. And um, so, and I, I really feel like if you really love that and you love the people you're cooking for, I think it makes the food taste better. I just do. And so I, I think it's a huge part of preparing food and sharing it with, with friends and family. Rod, I want to bring you back into the conversation. What I found really interesting about your book, I, I thought cookbook, okay, awesome pictures. And as I'm reading it, the first several dozen pages read more like a memoir and telling your story. Why did you want to set the book up like that as opposed to just opening it up and seeing uh, the first recipe right away? You know, um, when we were doing the book, the first thing we talked about is the recipes and how it started, where it came from, who gave us the idea. And, and, and without, in all that discussion, I was sitting on my back porch in the middle of the pandemic and I said, let me tell you how this recipe came about. Let me tell you where it started, how the idea of this recipe came about. And all of it just started with me telling more of what was going on around me when I found a recipe. 
and before you know it, me and my co-author, uh, Lolis, we just said, let's tell a little bit about Rodney. And I wanted to share Rodney's world and the recipes as well. One of the things I found very interesting in your story was you cooked your first whole hog, which I've never done before, but I have to imagine it's not that easy, but you cooked your first one when you were just 11 years old. I mean, how have you, obviously you've grown up since then, but what have you learned since then and cooking that first full hog? Wow, cooking that first hog at 11, first of all, was a chore. You know, growing up in small towns, you have chores and you have duties. And one of them that day was to help cook the hog. And in doing that, I've learned now that that was an early preparation on doing everything that I do now. I apply that particular day, I remember it so clearly, to everything that I do now. Dedication, focus, paying attention to everything that I do, um, how it's done, the process of the cooking, and all of the conversation and learning around cooking that hog, because it's a 12-hour process. And I, I know that it can't be uh, real uh, as fast as cooking bacon, which is about the only thing I can do. <laughs> so, Trisha, I want to talk to you uh, some more now. I mean, when you think about this fourth book, how did you want it to be different from the previous three? And how was that process different for, for you when putting this together, especially with this you know, pandemic all around all of us and the way we're eating and the way we're cooking and consuming food is a lot different? Well, I, I wrote my first book with my mom and my sister right after my dad had passed away. My dad was the barbecue guy. Like I, my dad would be loving this conversation. I would love this book of Rodney's because this was his thing. Like he was so good at this and he would cook for the whole town. And when he was gone, it was for us, it was a way to kind of keep him alive and keep his memory alive with, with his cooking. And it was really just those things that either weren't written down or were not that hard, but if you don't know how to do them, you don't know how, like like my mama, we were, we were doing the fried chicken and she's like, you cook it till it sounds right. And I said, mom, we have to tell people like how long to cook the chicken before you flip it over. And she's like, when it gets quiet, when it's ready to flip. And if you cook chicken enough, you, you understand that you learn that. And then, you know, I, I never dreamed we'd, we would write more than one book and I never dreamed I'd have a cooking show. So it's come out of something I really enjoy. This book felt a lot like the first one for me, even though we've already shown you how to make mama's fried chicken and we've already shown you how to make collard greens I took some of those things and kind of showed how I do them now and and how they've morphed into other recipes and and you always seem to find that a recipe that you thought was lost I found a recipe for fried pies I see you got one too Rodney um that that yes. my grandma used to make for my dad and we didn't know where the recipe was and it's not that hard but he was adamant that this wasn't the right recipe and we found it in her handwriting for this book so you're always kind of, it's always reliving those family stories and finding those recipes. And this one just felt really special to me because I had time to really every day wake up, work on it, test recipes, tweak things, write down my thoughts. And it was just, a, it was a really good thing for me. Uh, is there a recipe in this book, Trisha, that is just like your favorite if you if i were to come over tonight and you were going to open it up and and put something together for me which i'm sure i would love everything but which one would it be well i i think i would try to impress you with um i make it my favorite thing right now is a chicken pot pie burger and it's like it tastes just like chicken pot pie but it's it's just everything goes in the chicken burger and then it's on a bun with gravy with, and it's like, I don't know, it's, it's comfort food and it's different at the same time. And it's kind of my favorite thing right now. Oh, well, I, I did see that one. I peeped that one out earlier when I was looking. Uh, so uh, Rodney, you know, you had, um, I don't know if you knew this when you were setting out to write this book, but this is the first cookbook by a black pit master. Did you know that when you set out to write it? And have you even thought about the impact of that? I did not know that I was the first Black pit master to write a cookbook. Um, I had no idea. When I first heard it said, I was like, okay, good thought. I appreciate the comment, but um, never really paid any attention to it until it kept being repeated over and over. And I said, oh, this must be true. But I never knew. And I want to ask you, is there a recipe in this book that would be the first one that you would make um, if we were coming into your house tonight? 
wow, if you were coming into my house tonight, which recipe? I would probably try to get you with that smash burger or the steak sandwich. Because at home, I'm that guy that want to get it done quick on the grill. And I, that probably that steak sandwich or the, the smash burger, just to try to catch you. I'd like to come over. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I want to talk to you both. I mean, when you think about food and books, what is makes it fun for you to do what you do every day in the kitchen, but then put it on paper for to share with the rest of us? Uh, Trish, you want to go first? Uh, sure. I mean, for me, it's that I, I always grew up sharing recipes. There were a couple of little ladies in my hometown that wouldn't tell you how to make the, the whatever, or they get, or leave an ingredient out, you know, because they didn't want you to get the recipe. But I've always been a big believer in, if it's good, I want to show you how easy it is to make, and I want you to be able to make it for yourself. And so I think for me, cookbooks are so cool because it's really the ultimate recipe swap. You know, it's like, here's some things that are not hard to make, and they're good, and they're easy, and I want you to be able to make them too. I would have to echo that. Um, you know, same thing. You get to stand around and talk about the recipe. Me, I don't mind sharing. I've told everything that we've done in our book. You know, recipes are just the way we do them in the restaurant. And for me, I wanted, if you notice, the spine of our book is bright colored. So I wanted to just catch your attention, make it simple, put it in a way that you can grab it real quick and come up with an idea or start another dish if you don't have your first dish the way that you really like it to be served. So I wanted just to be able to open up a book and be easy to grab a recipe and present it to your guests. And speaking of guests, I want to remind everyone watching, you can uh, ask questions because we are going to leave time for that at the uh, end of this conversation. So please put those in the chat feature right now and uh, we will leave some time for that at the end. Uh, so Trisha, I want to ask you, you know, in the book you talk about going outside your culinary comfort zone. Uh, what does that mean to you? And how did you go outside that comfort zone when you were putting this new book together? Well, I, like I said, I grew up making the things that my mama made, you know, so I really knew how to make, you know, nine or 10 things, you know, and, and I learned, I set the table a lot and I cracked the ice cubes for the table. And then when I moved to Nashville, I, um, I missed home. I missed home cooking and I would call home and ask my mother how to make the simplest things. And she never made me feel like any question was too simple. Um, and then when I when I had um, a cookbook out and then had some success and I started going to some of these food festivals, I thought these chefs are just going to be like, we don't even want to talk to you. You're just a home cook. You don't know what you're doing. And they were the ones, a lot of these chefs that you've seen on TV, they just made me feel like, um, no pun intended, that I did bring something to the table that was real and that was good. And then when we started doing the show for Food Network, um, I was teamed up with a couple of, I call them culinary goddesses that work on the show. And we got to be fast friends and they just made me feel like um, they could learn from me and I could learn from them. And so there's things that they've taught me in the kitchen. There's ingredients that they've brought in that um, that we just didn't use in my house. You know, we used our exotic spices were salt and pepper and maybe some garlic powder if you were getting crazy, you know, but that was kind of it. And they really taught me a lot. And then I've taught them things like my mama said, if you're going to make deviled eggs, to flip the eggs in the carton the night before you cook the, the bowl of eggs because in travel, in transit, all those yolks settle. And if you flip the egg, the yolk will land right in the center. So the next day when you boil those eggs, you have perfect deviled eggs for your church social. You know, little things like that, that that my mama taught me that I got to share with them. And Trisha, how special is it for you, I have to imagine, um, to do this incredible work alongside with your sister? It's really everything. I mean, she's my person and, and Beth and I have, uh, you know, she's my, we've been, the, we've been in the kitchen together our whole lives. And so we have the same stories. And um, I always say she's my much older sister, but she's not much older than me, but she has just a couple more years to, of memories than I do. So sometimes if I'm going, I don't remember that she'll fill in the blank for me. And it's so, it's such a, a wonderful thing. And she's a really great cook. I mean, she, she's married and has three kids who are now grown. So she really started cooking for a family before I did. And so she's a, she's a great cook herself. I mean, my, my picture is on the front because I have a, a record deal. I, I make music and people know who I am, but she is just as much a part of 
of this book as, as I am because she really knows her stuff. And she's the, like I said, it's like we have this shared memory of childhood in our families that, that we, I don't have with anybody else. No, that's so beautiful. Um, Rodney, you write in uh, your cookbook here, especially in the beginning when you're telling your story, um, just about the sacrifices that you had to make to grow your business. Can you talk a little bit about that and what you learned uh, through the sacrifice? You know, growing up in Hemingway, South Carolina, a town of 400 people, the, the biggest thing there is your imagination. And a lot of times people are so comfort, comfortable with their surroundings and how things are going in the area that they are afraid to step out. And I was nervous about leaving and I decided, you know, if you don't take a chance, you, you'll never know. And I took the chance in stepping out, opening up in Charleston, expanding my culinary ideas and thoughts with other, I call them family now, staff members, um, learning their thoughts and traditions growing up. And, and I decided to go for it. And I wanted to expand and, and learn more and grow outside of my, my area. And what would you today tell 11-year-old Rodney, who was doing that chore and uh, doing that first whole hog by himself as just a young boy, what would you go back and tell him now that you've learned uh, what you've learned at this point? Wow, I would go back and tell 11-year-old Rodney, keep build your confidence higher now. Don't wait until you're in your 30s. Um, learn as much as you can business-wise. Continue to respect people and everything is going to be great. Every day will be a good day. Trisha, I want to bring you back in because I think uh, reading so far, one of my favorite parts uh, was your essay to bacon, <laughs> which is my one of my favorite foods. I could eat bacon every single day. I know I'm not supposed to, but I just thought that was so clever. Can you talk just about this essay to bacon, if you will, and why you even felt that bacon needed its own shout out in the book? I don't know. I mean, I think bacon, you know, there, I think there's a bacon cookbook. I think if bacon deserves its own book for sure. Um, I, I just, you know, it's one of my favorite things to eat and and growing up in my house, you know, my mom saved all the bacon drippings in a coffee can and they were, it was up above the stove. And, um, you know, it's just, a, it's it, the flavoring in different things. I always use bacon drippings and cornbread instead of butter. I love butter too. But, um, and then as I have, have grown in my learning of how to cook more things, I've really learned the value of mixing that salt um, bacon flavor with sweet. So like, we have a pecan sticky bun in here that has bacon um, instead of butter in it. And then also bacon in the, in the sticky buns, like just, there's just nothing ever wrong with bacon. I just, it's just the perfect food. And so I don't know. And in writing, because I did write this, all this myself, there were a lot of late nights. I'm sitting up going, okay, I need to tell a story about collard greens. I need to figure out what I'm going to say here. And then I would just be like, I just want to write about bacon. And so that, that kind of ode to bacon came in out of one of those late nights. I need to write a love letter to bacon. Sometimes you just need to. And uh, yes. I got to say, what does uh, Garth and the rest of the family, how proud of you, how proud of you are they? Um, and just what you've been able to do with this show. And now this fourth book that's about to hit store shelves. Well, they eat well, so they're happy. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think that, um, I, again, it's something I don't think any of us knew was going to happen as a result of just writing a book and it, it being this way. You know, I'm married to a guy who's like the most famous country music entertainer on the history of planet Earth. And so it's kind of fun when we go somewhere and people are like, I love you, Garth, but I love Trisha's show. I'm like, really? Like, really? That's okay. That's fine. Um, but he, he really, he wrote the forward for the book and he, he, he really is my biggest fan. And, and he tested everything. He was, he was, you know, he, and Garth is really honest, which is great. Sort of, if he loves the food, he's, there's like yummy sounds and no response. If he, if he thinks it's missing something, he'll say, um, well, that's fine. I mean, maybe the first 10 years of our marriage. Now he says, it just doesn't taste like anything. Do you feel that way? And I'm like, seriously. Yeah. So it's, uh, but he's honest and I appreciate that. And he's usually right, which I just can't believe I just said, but he is. <laughs> and Rod, we know the business is, is doing real well. And uh, I mean, is your goal to write a book too? Do you want to catch up to Trisha and maybe go for four books? I don't know. Hats off to you, Trisha, for four books. Um, this one took, took a toll on me. It, it was a lot of work. 
whatever. But uh, I don't know. I'm thinking about book number two right now. I'm not positive yet, but maybe. You will. I said no. I said there'll never be a second book. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're looking for number five from you, Tricia, and uh, number two from you, Rodney. Um, we are getting a bunch of questions, so I want to leave time um, for that for sure. Uh, so we have one right now. And either of you feel free to um, answer this one. But are there any traditional recipes that people today may have forgotten about that you wish they would rediscover? Wow. Um, Go ahead. Wow. I'm thinking. That's a tough answer because, you know, growing up in certain areas, like Trisha said, you don't always have a lot of ingredients that you're exposed to. Um, so... Wow. That's a good question. You know, we have a chicken perlu recipe in our book that's uh, kind of a different tradition than what I grew up with. And the way that they did it in my hometown, they did it a little different with sausage, rice, bacon, uh, kitchen bouquet, and uh, chicken. Yeah, I think that's it. That sounds good. I was just thinking about that. We had, a, we had wild muscadines some people call them scuppernongs that grow where I'm from. And we used to eat them off the trees, but we found a recipe for this book that was in my mom's stuff that I don't know how we missed. And my sister and I, neither one remember eating it as a kid and it's for a pie. And I mean, you cook the skins and the filling and then you strain the skins, but you put the skins in the pie so they're kind of chewy. And then you do like a peanut butter drizzle. That was my addition. I wanted to make it taste like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And I mean, I don't know why we weren't making this my whole life, but I, I want everybody to make this pie because it, it it feels like something really traditional, um, but it wasn't something that I was familiar with. Okay, I like both of those. Another question here for either of you or for both of you, what's your family's go-to recipe when you don't have much time that everyone loves and that's quick and easy to prepare? Wow, pork and beans and rice. Oh, Seriously. Yeah. Uh, smoked sausages cut up with some onions, some beans, and white rice and mix it all together. Quick, simple, great meal. And everybody's happy in my house. That's good. Mine's usually biscuits and something because I almost always have self-rising flour and butter and buttermilk. And so I can make a biscuit. And then you can figure out any sort of like if I have sausage, it'll be sausage gravy or if I have ham, we'll make ham biscuits or pimento cheese, whatever we got on hand, I can make anything go with a biscuit. And I always have a canned biscuits. See, I'm trying, I'm getting there. I'm getting there, but I'm gonna learn your recipe, Trish. I'm gonna learn your recipe. Uh, so another great question here. Um, someone asked that both of your cuisines obviously have roots in the South. For you, what distinguishes Southern cu cuisine from other cuisine? I would have to say our uh, not having the fear of adding the extra salt, the extra flavor, the bacon flavor that Trish spoke on earlier, um, those type of things, just putting it all in there, putting your whole soul in your, in your food. I agree with that 100%. I think, you know, Julie Charles said everything in moderation, including moderation, you know, and it's like, you're not going to eat... Um, I mean, I want to eat bacon every day, but I don't. Well, you're not going to eat some of these things every single day. But when you, for me, if you're going to eat a, a really good dessert or you're going to eat a really good meal, use the good stuff, you know, and make it, make it worth it. Make it, make it good. Um, and that was the way that we were raised. I didn't have a, um, a vegetable in it from a can in a grocery store until I moved to Nashville because we canned everything ourselves and everything was fresh. And I was really spoiled um, I think that's the other key is that there's so, you know, in the South for us, most everybody had a really good garden and you could, if you didn't, if you weren't growing it, your neighbor had it. And um, so you could always eat, eat that way. The one thing that I think is similar is that, you know, the, the stuff that I grew up on that's very uniquely Southern to me and is comfort food to me, somebody out in California's grandma made biscuits for them too. And they may have been a little bit different, but it's their comfort food. So we all have that we're also tied to the food that we grew up on, wherever that happens to be. Trisha, this question's for you. Someone wanted to ask, um, they say you and Beth share your family recipes, but do you ever create recipes just based on your cravings? 
Oh yeah, I get in a lot of trouble with that. I I, I go to bed at night and most people think about what they're going to do the next day. I think about, so if I were to like those, those, those potato chips that are dipped in chocolate, what if I made a brownie and I put potato chips in it and then I figured out and I put bacon in that too, because bacon goes in everything. And then I'll wake up and be like, I think we can make that. I think that'll work. And then that's how a recipe sort of becomes a thing. I, I was, I was thinking one day about I love the inside of the Oreo, you know, so I'm going to figure out how to make the inside of the Oreo, but I'm going to put it between my mom's brownies recipe and that's going to be a thing. And now we have double stuffed brownies. You know? So I get into a lot of trouble when I have a craving and it usually ends up being a recipe. I like that. I like that. Rodney, question for you. Um, this viewer has one funny question, one serious. The first one is the funny. When are you going to put a restaurant in Texas? And the serious question is, do you have a great barbecue recipe that you share, or barbecue sauce, I should say, recipe that you share in your book? Well, um, first of all, we do have a barbecue recipe that we share in the book. We have a couple of them in there. Uh, the original Rodney sauce is in the book. Um, opening a restaurant in Texas, hmm, maybe. Never know. We'll see. There you have it. There you have it. I want to request one in DC if we're putting in requests. I'm just saying. <laughs> Um, and then some another question for both of you, um, and you kind of uh, touched on it in our conversation, but if you want to expand it all, um, how did your families inspire your cooking and your cookbooks? For me, it was a, it was a tradition of just family, um, you know, a lot of it centered around church socials, family reunions. Everybody would bring the thing that they made, um, and there was a lot of socializing and a lot of food being made. Um, my dad always believed in making more than you need because he didn't want anybody to be hungry. Um, and I've, I've, I've taken that on from him. My mother was um, a school teacher who always had a meal on the table at six o'clock. I don't do that. I, I should. I sometimes do, but not every day. But um, she was a really great baker. And so I think I got my love of making desserts from her. Um, my dad believed in having fun in the kitchen. So when he was done in the kitchen, every pan was used and there was usually like flour on the ceiling. Um, but he was a really good cook. So I, I think in that tradition of really gathering people, all my memories of childhood of my family really center around um, food and, and the farm and growing vegetables and all of that. So I think they're, I think they have, my, my folks have everything to do with why I'm here doing this today. Um, likewise, a lot of my recipes are inspired by memories, and most of them are through family. Uh, my mom's banana pudding. I still remember her breaking off that cookie and giving me that cookie in, out of the, for the banana pudding. Uh, grandma's cornbread, um, how sweet it was when, when you bit into it. The catfish that was fried on Friday nights, you know, all these things were inspired through my, my family. And not to mention, to this very day, my staff will tell you about the sweet tea. My mom said, you make it sweet enough so that when you're finished with it, it tastes just as good with the last drink as it did with the first one. Trisha, question for you. How does or how can your music inspire your cooking or vice versa? Do you ever feel like they kind of go together? I, I definitely think music and food go together. I think there's a there's a for me, there's a creation process when you're making an album and when you're making a meal for people that you love and to share it. There's definitely, it's the, it, you know, to be honest, it's ego driven. You know, you sing when people applaud, you're like, that's pretty cool. When you make a dish and people can't speak because they enjoy the food, you're kind of, that's, that's applause. So there's definitely a selfish aspect of it, but it is the thing that brings us together. I mean, at least we said that in the very beginning of this conversation is that you know that we have it's easy to find the things that are different and to pull up pull us apart but music and food to me are both are two things that really do uh show us what we have in common and uh rodney for you um you know how has your uh south carolina roots and being able to have one of the top restaurants in the charleston area you know how does that uh, make you feel and um uh, you know as, as a somebody who started very young, have you just thought about your growth in all of this? And do you ever sit back and think like, wow, I did this? You know, every single day I think back, wow, look where I am, look what, look how far we've come um, from a tiny town of Hemingway, South Carolina, all the way to Charleston and cooking in different parts of the country, 
Um, I take a moment every day on, I take about a three to five mile walk every day. And I try to reflect on everything that's going on and how appreciative I am and humbled that hard work does pay off. And I, I wish to continue to do that and hopefully inspire a lot of people along the way. I think you're doing that. Both of you are. Uh, we have run out of time, unfortunately. I hope we answered uh, many of your questions, tried to get to most of them. Rodney Scott, Trisha Yearwood, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, to everyone watching, thank you for joining us. And please enjoy the rest of the National Book Festival. Have a great night.